It is my pleasure to welcome Daniel MacArthur to what is our last Genomics Big Dana and Medicine series for 2016. Um, I've known him now for a while uh, through my last uh, instantiation at, uh, in Boston. Um, Daniel got his PhD in uh, Sydney at the University of Sydney. Then he went off and did a postdoc at uh, the Sanger Center, I think, or Welcome Trust. Um, and then moved to Harvard Medical School, where he's become um, uh, instantly well known and well recognizable, recognized both for his work and also for his prolific blogging and sharing of his always interesting opinions, um, and for starting the Exact Server. And um, I will uh, let him tell you more about what he's doing and what he's working on in his talk. And so, Daniel, welcome to Mount Sinai. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela, and thanks, uh, of course, for the opportunity to come here and present today. Um, so I was actually set a challenge by Ema Kenny in the audience to get through this entire seminar without using the terms big data, personalized medicine, or Moore's law. So we're going we're to see we're going to see if I can get through the whole thing. And if I if I break if I break that promise, you guys should shout out and let me know that I've that I've screwed up. But that's my plan at the moment, anyway. So, uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, this is mostly work that's centred at the Broad Institute, but collaborating with many uh, international investigators to pull together a large collection of exome sequencing data and then think about ways in which we can use that large collection of, of data to inform um, our understanding of, of gene function and particularly interpreting genetic variation. And the, I guess the way we think about this is that we, we live in a pretty remarkable time to be doing human genetics. Human genetics provides us with a lever that allows us to move between different types of information and actually get uh, fundamental insight into the, into the biology of genomes. We have two very different types of information that we can uh, layer on top of genetic information. So of course we have functional genomic annotation, and most of you will recognize this screenshot from UCSC where we have layers of annotation that are, that are placed across the genome so that for any given base in the genome, we can say something about whether it is, uh, falls into a particular gene, whether it's exonic or intronic, um, if it's non-coding, whether it falls over a regulatory region, and, and, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, in many places, and uh, including strikingly here at Mount Sinai, there's also a huge amount of information we can collect on particular individuals. So it's possible now to build in these, in these amazing biobanks, uh, information on disease diagnoses, to pull together electronic health records, prescription registers, uh, information on quantitative traits, and all sorts of omic analyses like RNA sequencing and metabolomics to build up a picture of the phenotype of a particular individual. And the nice thing about genetic variation is it provides us basically with a way to pivot between those two sources of information. And so we can use genetic information in, in two fundamentally different ways. Uh, traditionally, and this is particularly true in clinical genomics, we've moved from phenotype through to, to gene. So we've used genetic information as a way of saying, given a person with an extreme phenotype, say someone who has some kind of Mendelian condition, wh where is the genetic, what is the genetic variant that is unique to them that causes that disease, and then what does that tell us about the function of that particular region of the genome? But as our genetic data sets have gotten larger, and as we started to build up more information about the function of different parts of the genome, we now have the opportunity to move in the opposite direction. So to find people who have what we would call extreme genotypes, and these might be people, for instance, who are knockouts for a particular gene or have an extremely rare variant that disrupts, say, an interesting region of the genome, we can now find those people in very large collections of, of genome or exome sequencing data and then, and then pull them back up and figure out what is, what is interesting about their phenotype, in what way are they unusual compared to the rest of the population. So I think we, we live in a time where it's actually possible for the first time ever to move in both directions relatively seamlessly thanks to the uh, development of very large-scale sequencing methods as well as um, the, the thoughtfulness of people who, who built biobanks like the Mount Sinai Biobank. So one of, one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in this ability to move back and forth through these large reference genetic data sets um, is my group's long-term interest in diagnosing rare diseases. And this is, this is really where we started getting uh, interested in reference data sets around about four years ago. So one of the things that became very clear as we started sequencing genomes and exomes from kids affected by severe muscle diseases, which has been my traditional disease focus, is, is it, we, we quickly realised that it was impossible to make sense of the genome with the reference data sets that currently existed, um, or at least it was very difficult. And what I mean by that is ideally what we'd like to be able to do for any of the variants that we found in one of our patients' genomes was to look that up in as, in as large a collection of reference individuals as we could get our hands on, and that could be anyone that, that had been sequenced and then ask a few different questions. Firstly, had that variant ever been seen before? 
Uh, if so, how common was it in the general population and in which populations was it common? And if it has been seen before, is it associated with any particular phenotype in that, in that broader collection of individuals? And, and does that fit with the phenotype we see in our patient? So that, uh, that movement back and forth between patient and reference data sets uh, is, is very powerful. And it's made all the more powerful by the sheer scale of the data that is now at least theoretically available to us. So we know now, and I think this is probably a lowball estimate, around the world there's easily been a million people who've had exomes or genomes sequenced. So that's an incredible amount of data. I mean, it, particularly if you think about how rapidly that's developed over the last five years, basically. We've moved from having a handful of people up to having over a million people where it's actually possible to collect genome-wide information about the distribution of variation, at least within the protein coding regions of the genome. But there are challenges, of course. So that's, that's a theoretical advantage if we were somehow able to magically look at all that data at the same time. Of course, for any one investigator, it's impossible to access all of those million data sets. And that's for a whole bunch of different reasons. There are, there are uh, many of those data sets have been generated in commercial centers. Uh, they're not interested in, in sharing their data for commercial reasons. Many of the data has been generated by academic centers. You'll be shocked to learn that even some academics don't like sharing their data. And there are also completely mundane uh, logistical reasons why sharing data is hard. It's, it's tough to move large amounts of data from one place to another. I think many of you will be familiar with that. And there's also another mundane reason, which is that uh, the data are often inconsistently processed. So each project that's involved, been involved in generating each piece of these million exomes or genomes has tended to do so using its own idiosyncratic processing pipeline and variant calling pipeline that, that results in slightly different variant calls that come out the other end. So what that means is if we were to take the end results of each of those different projects and just naively try to mesh them all together into one big data set, what we would have is a data set where the overall patterns of variation were dominated by technical artifacts or differences between different pipelines as opposed to interesting biological differences. So what we need then is a, is a large collection of individuals where exactly the same pipeline has been run across all of those individuals to give us a nice harmonized data set. And so that's what we set about doing, I guess, uh, now starting around about uh, two and a half to three years ago, um, as part of a, a coalition that eventually came to be called the Exome Aggregation Consortium, or EXAC. And the goal of EXAC uh, was, is very simple. Basically, what we're interested in doing is collecting raw exome sequencing data from as many people as we can get our hands on, uh, then taking all of that data and pushing it through exactly the same processing and variant calling pipeline, and then releasing the frequency data that we, for the variants that we discover to the world, so that anyone can use that in their own analyses. In mid-2014, so around about April 2014, after a long period of, of false starts and, and trouble generating large call sets that I'm not going to bore you guys with, we were able to successfully pull together a collection of raw exome, exome sequencing data from just under 92,000 samples. All of that data was sitting on the Broad uh, Institute's uh, cluster, so we had access to all of that raw data. Um, over, over a period of a few months, we were able to push that through the same variant calling, uh, joint reprocessing and variant calling pipeline, and ultimately have a single unified call set across all 92,000 samples. And then in October 2014, we released a subset of those data. So this is the two thirds, or around about 60 or so thousand samples that satisfied the following conditions. Um, they had to have very high quality sequence data. Um, they had to be unrelated to each other. So we removed samples that were genetically related to each other. Um, all of the samples that we released had consent that was consistent with public data sharing, at least of frequency data. And to the best of our ability, and I'll return to this later, to the best of our ability, we removed individuals and their first degree relatives who suffered from severe pediatric disease. So the goal of this resource was to collect a set of individuals who were not necessarily healthy, I'll say a bit more about that later, but at least, as far as we can tell, are broadly representative of the, of the general population in terms of their, uh, their disease patterns. Now I should say a little bit more about where these samples came from. You can see up here a, a very crude breakdown of the, uh, the sources of the different samples. The vast majority of these, uh, of these samples come from uh, complex disease case control studies um, of, of complex diseases such as type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease, a good collection of schizophrenia and, and uh, bipolar and other neuropsychiatric conditions, um, many of which were contributed by Pam and her, and her colleagues, and then a whole host of other, um, of other uh, samples that we were able to get mostly from studies of complex diseases, including the Cancer Genome Atlas, where we have included samples from people with cancer, but where we've only included the blood sequence, not the tumor sequence from those individuals. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the technical details, but for those who are interested, this is a, a rough schematic of the pipeline that we uh, pushed uh, all of these data through. It's a fairly simple um, BWA alignment, Picard reprocessing, and GATK haplotype caller pipeline. Um, for, for those who are interested in numbers, the numbers were very large. We had to basically start with a collection 
of raw sequence data that was almost a petabyte in size. So that's 925 terabytes. So that'd be about 4,000 laptops worth of data. And this was a huge amount of data that, of course, we had to wrangle across uh, multiple directories on the Broad Institute cluster. But after going through this processing step, we ended up with a final collection of variant, uh, variant calls that takes up about, compressed, takes up about 3.3 terabytes. And the total data set uh, required a substantial amount of compute, somewhere just under 20,000 CPU days of computing to get to the point um, where we could actually have something that was releasable. Um, fortunately, we could spread that over many, many clusters. So this, was some, this is something, particularly these later steps, are something we can now do for a new call set over the course of about a week. Um, and I should pause at this point to mention uh, that a huge amount of the actual wrangling was done by a postdoc in my lab, Monkel Lech, uh, who actually was almost single-handedly responsible for keeping an eye on the sequencing process and also doing a lot of the quality control that I'm going to elide over uh, in the rest of this talk to make sure that we actually had a, a really high-quality call set. So to cut a long story short, we ended up with a, with a collection of uh, exome sequencing data from 60,000 people. This is a really big collection of sequencing data. I put it on this graph to show you how much bigger it is compared to other previously publicly available uh, sets of sequencing data. This is the 1000 Genomes Project. The, the y-axis here is number of individuals. Uh, this is the NHLBI's exome sequencing project. And here is EXAC. It's nearly 10 times bigger, and it has lots of colors in it. Those colors correspond broadly to different continental uh, clusters of, of ancestry. You can see here that although there is a strong European bias in this collection, and, and here we're being opportunistic and just taking whatever exomes have been sequenced, for various historical reasons, there's a strong overrepresentation of European samples in that collection. We do still have a pretty good representation of samples of African American, Latino, East Asian, and South Asian ancestry as well. And these prove to be extremely useful, of course, in understanding whether variants that we find in patients from those ancestries are actually causal or not. So the, the resulting catalog of protein coding variation is also large. We found just over 10 million uh, genetic variants in total across all of the, the protein coding regions and flanking regions of the exome. That's about one variant every six base pairs, so it's quite a deep resolution of, of variation. And as we would expect, given the relatively recent expansion of, of uh, demographic history in humans, the vast majority of these variants are very rare and novel. Um, so you can actually see down on this plot here, um, each of these different bins is a, is a frequency, frequency bin. Um, here you can see the proportion of variants that were seen only once in our data sets. That's a frequency of about 1 in 100,000, allele frequency about 1 in 100,000. Here are variants that were seen less than 1 in 10,000 times, and here is everything else. So the vast majority of variants that we found, and I can reassure you that the, most of these are real after doing a lot of different QC exercises, the vast majority of variants that we find are extremely rare in the population. And this is really the first glimpse that we've had at variants at this very low end of the frequency spectrum, at least on a large scale. And of course, these very low frequency variants are often the ones we're most interested in, particularly in the context of, of severe Mendelian diseases. So getting access to these variants was really important. Uh, so the goal of EXAC was to make a data set that other people could use. So in, at ASHG in 2014, we released a, a, a browser. Um, the browser was built by Konrad Kaczewski, another postdoc in my lab. Um, it's available for anyone to access uh, their, their favorite gene. Um, you can go to exact.broadinstitute.org and the VCF across, uh, the site's VCF across all 10 million variants is also freely available. So you can download that and use that as well. Um, if, you, if you jump to your favorite gene in the Exact browser, you'll see a picture, picture that looks like this. Um, basically what, the, what these blue uh, peaks here show is the coverage across our 60,000 exomes um, for each of the exons of, of your favorite gene. In this case, it's PCSK9, which is one of my favorite genes. Um, you can see here that there are some exons that are not very well covered, and there are many exons that are extremely well covered. And so for these well covered exons, we would expect that um, nearly all of the variation in our 60,000 samples has actually been captured. Um, for some of these other less well covered exons, that will be less true. Below that, there's a, there's a long list of all of the variants that we've discovered in or around that particular gene. And you can, you can click on those variants to get more information about its frequency in the population, and also how confident we are that the variant is actually real. And as of last year, it's also now possible to view the raw read data for most of the variants in the data set. So we've, we've taken here a random sampling of five uh, carriers of that particular variant. And so if you, for instance, have, have some reason to doubt that a particular insertion or deletion variant is real, you can look at the raw read data and, and convince yourself that either it's real or perhaps it's a, it's a sequencing artifact. So um, I'm going to spend the, the rest of this presentation going over some of the scientific stories that have emerged from analysis of the, the exact data set. 
Um, for those of you who are interested in digging more into the details, we have a, uh, our manuscript is available on BioArchive as a preprint. It's not, it's not yet published. Um, if you Google BioArchive MacArthur, you can, you can track that down. And basically, uh, I'll, so some of the stories that I'll, that I'll mention in detail here are described there, and I'll also go into detail in, in, uh, for, on one of the other stories in particular. But some spoilers, in case you happen to read that paper, um, some of the things we found in EXAC were firstly the presence of very widespread mutational recurrence, which is a bit of a surprise. This is basically, we find evidence that at, particularly at highly mutable sites in the exome, that the same variants have appeared multiple times within the history of the population. So we actually find, particularly at CPG sites, many often you know, the same mutation has actually clearly independently occurred two or three or four uh, separate times within the history of this population. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, EXAC's improvement to, on variant filtering. Um, and the way in which we can use XAC to identify genes and regions of genes that are depleted for normal variation within the population. Um, I'll spend the last probably half of my talk discussing one particular story where we've used XAC to understand the penetrance and the pathogenicity of variants uh, that, that have been reported to be associated with a very severe dominant disease. And then I won't really mention this, but one of the other analyses that we have done and are very, still very actively pursuing is the discovery of human knockouts. So people who have homozygous or compound heterozygous null variants within a particular gene, um, who we may be able to potentially recontact to learn more about the function of that particular gene. So I'll go through these, these particular sections. So the, the reason, the, the key reason that we event, the originally thought of building something like EXAC was to improve the filtering of variants that we were discovering in our rare disease patients. So that was the, the sort of use case that I showed in one of my, one of my first slides. Um, and EXAC, because it's, because it's so big and also because it's diverse, turns out to be much better than previous uh, publicly available data sets at, at performing this filtering step. So here what we've done is to take 100 individuals from each of five different continental groups. Um, they're colored here. And then basically we set a frequency cutoff of, of, of one in a thousand, which is probably broadly appropriate for a, for a dominant disease variant. And then we just ask if we apply that frequency threshold and apply, uh, basically look for variants that are confidently over one in a thousand and discard them from, uh, from, our, from a patient sample, uh, in any one of our populations, uh, how many variants are left? And it turns out if you were to use the NHLBI's exome sequencing project data set, um, you would be left with, in East Asians, almost 1,000 variants, um, in Europeans, about 600 variants. With, if you apply EXAC as your filtering strategy, that number goes down very substantially. So for almost all populations, that goes down to somewhere between 100 and 150. So again, the benefit here is basically because we have a much bigger reference data set, and also because it's more diverse, so we can look across more populations, we have much better power now to throw away variants that are not actually causal. And we can also apply this to, to variants that have previously been reported to be disease causing and ask how confident we are that they are actually associated with disease. Um, so Anne O'Donnell, uh, Luria in, in my group, actually went through in a, in a rather painful exercise and took uh, about 200 or so variants that had previously been reported to be associated to be severely pathogenic variants in the, either the human gene mutation database or ClinVar. And then she, uh, but it also showed up at a population frequency of at least 1% in at least one exact population. And she then dug through all of the literature supporting each of those variants to try to figure out if they were actually a Mendelian variant. And as you might expect, given the frequency in these populations, the majority of these turn out to be errors. Um, either, they are, either there's very weak support for that variant being pathogenic in the original literature, and that almost always corresponds to a situation where there's a benign variant that's been falsely assigned as being pathogenic. In some cases, the error, the, the error actually fell within the database itself. So the authors had not claimed that a variant was pathogenic, but had been sucked up into the database as being pathogenic. There's a handful of other different classes of variation here, and only a very tiny number of variants that actually did turn out to be Mendelian disease causes, typically for relatively mild Mendelian diseases. So this exercise alone, even at this, at this very crude uh, frequency threshold, allows us to discard you know, a, a, large, a, a large number of previously reported pathogenic variants as clearly not being pathogenic. Uh, this is actually the most egregious example. This is a, a really embarrassing example. This was published in 2014 um, in, a, in a journal called Renal Failure. In the abstract of, the, of this paper, the authors argue that there is a particular variant, uh, val 2 ala uh, in an unpronounceable gene uh, that they argue is, is likely to be causal for a se very severe recessive disease um, involving deafness and also a renal phenotype. Um, we, we curated the, the particular variant. It turns out to be homo homozygous in this report in a single consanguineous child. There's no parental sequencing, no controls sequenced. And the authors, despite this being 2014, didn't look in 1,000 genomes where it turns out the variant was present with a frequency of 70%. So I think in that case, we can be pretty confident this is not actually a truly uh, fully penetrant recessive disease variant 
and I guess all this tells us is that in general, if you're if you're trying to report pathogenic variants out in a uh, in an individual, you need to make sure that you use all of the publicly available resources that are that are available at the time. And in 2014, there's really no excuse not to be doing that. Okay, so um, one of the other things we can do with XAC is look not just at the variants that are actually present in the data set, but also the variants that are missing from the data set, and, and therefore zoom in on regions that are actually depleted for variation compared to what we would expect to see by chance. And this is, this is work that's been led by Caitlin Smoker, a graduate student in Mark Daly's lab who's been working with my lab for this, uh, for this analysis in XAC. So skipping over the details, what Caitlin has done, and actually these details are quite well described in a 2014 paper um, that Caitlin led. What, what Caitlin has done is to build a mutational model that allows her to predict for, for a given number of individuals, how many variants of a particular functional type we would expect to see in a, in a specific gene. And this basically uses things like the triplet context of a particular, uh, particular site. So if you have a site that happens to fall in a CPG location, for instance, it will give you a much higher probability that a mutation will occur there. And you can actually use that mutation model, mutational model and scan it across the whole gene and then predict how many missense variants, for instance, we would expect to see in that gene in 60,000 people. Now, it turns out Caitlin's model is extremely well calibrated. Um, so here you can see the correlation between the, uh, each dot here is a gene. And on the x-axis, we have the number of silent or synonymous variants that Caitlin's model predicts we would see in that gene. On the y-axis, we have the number of observed variants in, in our 60,000 samples in XAC. And you can see here the fit is exquisitely good. We have an R-squared of about 0.96. That's about as good as we would possibly hope to get given our sample size. So, so Caitlin's model predicts very nicely how many, how many neutral variants we would expect to see in a given gene. But as we start to look at other functional classes of variation, so here we have missense variants, and then most strikingly for loss of function variants, and here loss of function is defined as variants that are predicted to result in the truncation of a protein coding gene, so a nonsense or a frame shift, uh, sorry, a nonsense or a splice disrupting SNP in this case. You can see here that basically every gene in the genome is, is depleted for loss of function variation and falls below the line. And that's not a surprise at all, of course. What it tells us is that for most genes in the genome, loss of function variants are deleterious and they're, they're weeded out by natural selection from, from the population, at least at some rate. What's cool though about having this calculation across 60,000 samples is that for the first time we can actually calculate how far below the line each gene falls. In other words, how strongly depleted each gene is for loss of function variation compared to expectations. And that gives us a quantitative estimate of how strong the selection is that's acting against loss of function variants in that particular gene. In other words, how nasty the effect is of loss of function variants in that gene. So let me illustrate that with two examples. Here's one gene where we know exactly what happens if you have a heterozygous loss of function variant. This is a gene called DINK1H1. Um, and a de novo mis heterozygous missense and loss of function variants in this gene are known to be associated with a range of, of relatively severe neurodevelopmental phenotypes. So here, Caitlin's model predicts almost perfectly the number of synonymous variants we would expect to see in this gene in XAC. But there's a strong depletion of missense variants. So about two thirds of all of the expected missense variants in this gene are missing. And almost all of the loss of function variants are missing uh, in this gene, indicating that even if we didn't know that missense or loss of function variants in this gene were damaging, we would be able to predict that pretty clearly from the, the patterns, the distribution of variants uh, within the XAC data set. And it's worth noting that of these four observed <laughs> loss of function variants in XAC, Two of these are likely not actually loss of function. One of them appears to be a sequencing error. The other looks like very much like an annotation error. And there are two, two individuals who do carry DINK1H1 loss of function variants in the XAC data set. We unfortunately don't have phenotype data that we can use to chase those individuals up. So here's another gene where we actually don't know what the phenotype is associated with loss of function variants. Uh, we know that UBR5 falls in the ubiquitin pathway. We know that if you knock it out in mice, it kills them during embryogenesis. But there's no human loss of function phenotype, at least last time I checked associated with this gene. And yet this gene has a very similar pattern of variation compared to DINK1H1. So you can see Caitlin's model works well for synonymous variants. About half of the missense variants are missing from this gene. And of the 125 loss of function variants we would expect to see in UBR5, we actually observe one. And again, we're pretty confident that that one variant is not actually a real loss of function variant. So this tells us that even though we have no idea what phenotype is associated with loss of function variants that fall within UBR5, there almost certainly is some disease phenotype associated with heterozygous loss of function within this, within this particular gene. In other words, this gene is almost certainly a haploinsufficient disease gene, but where the phenotype is unknown. So overall, uh, we can develop a method, uh, a metric called PLI, or the probability of loss of function intolerance. Uh, this is an EM-based method that Caitlin developed. And overall, what she discovers is, is just over 2,500 genes that show significant 
uh, a, a significant signature of, of loss of function intolerance. In other words, we can be pretty confident that there is some heterozygous LOF phenotype associated with that particular gene. Um, although in many cases, we don't know what that is. And in fact, although almost all known haploinsufficient genes fall into this category, for 75% of the genes, we have absolutely no idea what the phenotype is. There's no associated disease with this, with this uh, particular gene. So that, that, could, that could explain one of two things. Either the phenotypes associated with heterozygous loss of function are weak, and that could be the case in, in some situations, or in other situations, it may well be that we never observe heterozygous LOF individuals because they're lost from the population during embryogenesis. So there's, there's, some of these could actually be haploinsufficient embryo lethal genes. So that's, that's applying this uh, depletion method to whole genes. Now, of course, the method can also be used to, to apply to smaller regions. And so what Caitlin's been, this is actually new and unpublished data, what Caitlin's been working on over the last year is a, is a method for narrowing in on regions of missense depletion that fall, that fall uh, in, a subgenic, in a subgenic region. So in other words, breaking, being able to break up a particular gene into chunks where some of those chunks are actually missense depleted and some of those chunks show no evidence of, of selection acting against missense variants. So here is a cartoon example. Um, overall, this gene has about 48% of the observed missense variants in the gene as a whole. But we can actually break that down into two chunks. Over here, we have a chunk which is relatively unconstrained. It's missing about 9% of its missense variation. And over here, we have uh, two exons that are highly constrained. They're missing about 80% of their missense variation. So, so you can imagine with the, with the appropriate method, it's actually possible to carve this gene up into, into segments that reflect the fact that different regions of the gene have different selection pressures acting on missense mutations. This works extremely well. Uh, I'll show you one example. Uh, this is a gene called CDKL5 where uh, this has one region of missense constraint, sorry. This has one region of missense constraint which is indicated by this, this uh, horizontal bar up here. Uh, that, that actually turns out to correspond to the known, uh, protein coding, known protein coding domains within that particular gene. And it also happens to correspond to the region where basically all of the dominant mutations, dominant missense mutations that are known to be associated with uh, severe infantile seizures in this gene fall within exactly that same region. So again, even if, we didn't have, even if we didn't have this mutation data, even if we didn't know that this region was enriched for disease causing mutations, we'd be really co relatively confident in predicting that a missense variant that's found within this N-terminal region is much more likely to cause disease than a missense mutation that's found in the rest of the gene. And this is work that uh, Caitlin is now expanding further. One of the things that she can say is that if you, if you take all severe haploinsufficient disease genes and look at all of the missense variants in ClinVar in those particular genes, it turns out that 81% of those are found within the 14% of the most constrained coding sequence within those genes. So this is clearly giving us quite a lot of predictive power for zooming in on regions of genes that are most likely to be causal if we find a missense variant within them. And that's now being applied in the context of autism, schizophrenia, and a, and a, a series of other severe developmental diseases. Okay, so that's, um, that's one way in which we can look at missing variation. I, I wanted to finish, oh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, you should totally feel free to interrupt. Um, but but if, if not, I'll move on to the last um, story that I, that I wanted to tell about AXAC, um, which stems from, in part, from an observation that appeared r really early on um, as we started generating our first large-scale exome call sets. Um, even after filtering for individuals, uh, removing as best we could individuals who, who have no one severe pediatric diseases, what we found was many hundreds of people who carried previously reported and of, oftentimes confidently reported dominant, uh, severe, dominant mutations that are associated with very severe pediatric manifestations. And these were found in individuals who were, who were not uh, nominally healthy or at least were falling into cohorts that were, that were meant to be depleted for, for such phenotypes. So there are many possible explanations here. Um, it, it could be that some fraction of XAC individuals actually have an undiagnosed severe dominant disease. We think that number is very small, but it, it certainly will be greater than zero. Uh, for a number of these variants, we were able to show very easily that, that the original report of a variant being pathogenic was actually false, and that uh, often, typically not quite as egregious an example as the 70% example that I showed you earlier. But of course, there are many uh, reported dominant disease-causing mutations where actually the, the evidence supporting that being pathogenic is extremely weak. We found a handful of really intriguing examples where it turns out that uh, there, the mutations that we discovered in XAC individuals were absolutely associated in a, in a germline state with severe, uh, with severe dominant disease. But in our XAC individuals, they were actually clearly present as somatic mosaics. So they're present at a frequency below 50% in the, in the blood DNA of those individuals. And these, these almost certainly represent somatic expansions of blood uh, cells that are occurring in XAC individuals, um, but are not actually present in other tissues for those individuals. So that explains why they don't have the disease. Intriguingly, in almost all of those cases, the, the gene where germline mutations confer a developmental disease 
those same genes, we know that loss of function mutations in a somatic state are often predisposed, uh, predisposing to cancer. So there appears to be some interesting examples of this overlap between genes where there are neurodevelopmental phenotypes associated with them as well as somatic muta mutations conferring cancer. And I guess in some, at least some of these XAC individuals, these variants present in their blood possibly indicate that there is a, a pre-malignant expansion of uh, blood cells uh, within, that, within, that person's, um, within that person's blood. And then the, f the final possible explanation, of course, is that these variants do actually have some association with disease, but they don't cause disease in everyone who carries them. So this is a question of either variable expressiv expressivity or, or penetrance. And so we set about thinking about ways in which we could untangle these. And at, at that time, we were very fortunate to have a, a very talented analyst come into the lab, Eric Villab Minikel. Um, and Eric came in with a very specific project um, that spoke to this question very directly. Um, and he was interested in this for a reason, uh, both, both a scientific reason, but also a, a profoundly personal reason. Uh, so this is Eric's wife, Sonia. Um, Sonia is, is shown here with her mother. This is early 2010. At the time, Sonia's mother was, was healthy and happy. Um, over the course of that year, so by the end of 2010, Sonia's mother was dead. Um, she had died of a, a, an incredibly rapid decline into dementia and then, uh, and then a very rapid demise for reasons that no one understood. Uh, so clearly there was some very rapid neurocognitive process occurring, but no one knew what had actually caused it. At the end of 2010, an autopsy was performed and uh, she was discovered to have died of prion disease. So prion disease, as some of you will know, is a, is a disease where, and I'll talk more about the, the background here, where prion protein accumulates within, within the brain itself, resulting in uh, very rapid dementia and death. In early 2011, Sonia received the news that her mother had actually been diagnosed with a genetic form of prion disease. So it turns out she carried a D178N mutation within the PRNP gene that was well known to be associated with, uh, with a, as far as we know, a 100% chance of uh, contracting uh, prion disease. Sonia and Eric uh, together made the decision that she would go on to get tested. And, and uh, a few months later, she received a report from a Brigham and Women's Genetic Testing Clinic uh, telling her that she does actually carry the mutation that killed her mother. Um, at the time, she was in her early 30s, so it means, and her mother had died in her mid-50s. Um, so, so this is obviously a horrific thing for any, uh, for any young couple to learn. Eric and Sonia, to their credit, did not spend any time mourning um, the, the situation they'd found themselves in. Instead, what they did is quit their jobs. Sonia at the time was a lawyer. Uh, Eric at the time was a town planner. Both of them abandoned their current careers and began the process of retraining as, as biologists with the goal of seeing if they, given the time that they have, the goal of seeing whether it's actually possible to develop therapeutics for prion disease. So Eric, this is a picture of Eric and Sonia actually in the, in the lab at the Brown Institute. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how that's working out in a second. So th the question, of course, that Sonia had when she received that report at Brigham and Women's Hospital was how confident it was that that D178N mutation that was present, clearly present in her DNA, how confident it was that that would actually result in her suffering the same fate as her mother. And this boils down in, in dry clinical language to the question of penetrance, uh, the probability of contracting a disease given that you have a particular genotype. And it's worth noting, and I think many people here in the room know this, but perhaps some don't, that for the vast majority of disease-causing mutations, we actually have no idea what the penetrance is. And that's because in most cases, we just haven't looked at large enough numbers of unascertained population controls to identify how many people actually carry a particular variant and then do the proper analysis, which is to then go on and say how many of those carriers do actually go on to contract the disease or how many of those carriers do actually have the disease. And to really drill down on the penetrance estimates of a given variant, we do actually need very large population-based controls, uh, cohorts that are genotyped without ascertainment. Um, there, are, there are other methods that you can use, but, but each of them has their own, has their own challenges. So we know quite a lot about the genetics of prion disease. Um, this has been a very well studied disease for, for a number of reasons. Um, despite the fact that it's, it's relatively rare, but still has an overall lifetime incidence of about one in 5,000. So it's among, it's among the more common of rare diseases. It's, it's famous and well studied for one very good reason. And that is that despite the fact that 85% of cases are, are sporadic, a notorious 1% of prion disease cases are required of infectious origin. And the most famous examples of these, of course, are the outbreak of variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in the UK that emerged as a result of prion, uh, prion contamination of beef, mad cow disease. Uh, so that's, that's that famous 1%. But we do also know that roughly 15% of cases fall into the same category as Sonia's mother, and that is they are driven by a dominant gain-of-function mutation within the PRNP gene. And as far as we can tell, in, in most of those cases, th these appear to be, to be fully genetic. One reason why prion disease is an excellent disease to study in the context of, of prevalence is that we have amazingly good uh, ascertainment of all of the of individuals who actually suffer from these diseases in Western populations. 
So there are surveillance centres in basically every Western, in every uh, industrialised country uh, that, that, are that are tasked with the goal of collecting every individual who's diagnosed with prion disease within that population. And the reason, of course, they're tasked with that is because we need to be able to detect those 1% um, of individuals who have that infectious origin. And almost all of the individuals who are reported to these surveillance centres undergo sequencing of PRNP. So that means we have the frequency data of basically every variant in PRNP in very large case series of individuals who've actually uh, suffered and, and died from prion disease. So despite that, there has actually been, there's actually relatively little known about the, the, how likely a given individual is to suffer from prion disease given that they carry a specific variant. So Mendelian segregation, for, for various reasons, uh, is, is only well established for, for a few variants. I'll mention them later. But we do know there are 63 variants that have been reported in databases to be causal. So there's many possible mutations that could actually be associated with this disease. And many attempts to, to identify penetrance estimates have not, uh, have not been especially successful or have had various caveats associated with them. So our rationale here was that we could actually use EXAC, despite the fact that we don't know for sure that people within EXAC will not go on to suffer from prion disease. The average age in EXAC is around about 55, but of course half the population is younger than the age of onset of prion disease. And it may well be that some of those individuals have gone on to get prion disease since, since their DNA was collected. So we don't know for sure that they won't go on to get prion disease. But we do know that EXAC was ascertained in a way that we would expect to not enrich for prion disease variants. So we can be pr pretty sure that the frequency of prion disease variants in EXAC is roughly the same as in the general population. And a key insight here is that completely penetrant variants, so variants that always cause disease in their carriers, in aggregate, should be no more common than the disease that they cause. And of course, this is very straightforward. If, if completely penetrant causal variants were more common in the population, then the disease would be more common. So it must be the case that this, uh, this frequency is lower, in a, is lower or the same in aggregate as the, as the disease itself. So we had a, a number of different data sets that we could pull from to study penetrance of prion disease variants. We had our 60,000 exac exomes, none ascertained specifically on neuro, neurodegenerative disease. We were able, in collaboration with 23andMe, to get access to just over half a million uh, customers, genotype data from half a million customers, where they had, uh, re they had genotyped 16 reportedly pathogenic variants within the PRNP gene. And of course, all of these individuals had, had agreed to consent for research. And then Eric, through a series of heroic uh, feats of uh, scientific diplomacy, managed to secure access to almost all sequenced prion disease cases in uh, the US, Europe, Australia, and Japan through direct contact with these uh, surveillance centers. This represents basically all definite or probable prion disease cases in these countries over the last 15 to 20 years. This is almost a complete saturation of the reported prion disease cases in these countries. And it's about as big a case series as we could ever hope to have, I think, for a disease as rare as prion disease. So now what can we do with this data? Well, the, the first thing we can do is we can estimate how many individuals we would expect to see in EXAC who actually carry prion disease causing mutations. And this is actually a pretty simple calculation. I, I won't go through it in, in too much detail here, except basically just to say that each of these individual factors has a little bit of wiggle room associated with it, but we think the final estimate is, is broadly robust. And basically, if you multiply these numbers together, what you end up with is a, a set of somewhere between one and two individuals in EXAC who should actually carry a prion disease causing mutation Given the, given the prevalence of prion disease within the general population. So that's what we expect. In fact, what we find are 13 different uh, reported prion disease causing mutations that in some are observed 52 times within the exact data set. So it's 30 times more common than we would expect to see by chance. 30, 30 times more common than we would expect to see given the prevalence of the disease. So something is clearly extremely wrong here. We get similar results in 23andMe, despite the fact that 23andMe doesn't survey all of the variants associated with prion disease. We expect to see roughly 15 alleles across the whole of, of 23andMe, and we observe about 10 times that number. So it's very clear that the prevalence of mutations that have been reported to cause prion disease is much higher than the, than the prevalence of prion disease itself. And so that suggests that either prion disease is much more common than we know, I think that's extremely unlikely given how accurately the surveillance centres are capturing those individuals, or some subset of these variants are not, in fact, completely penetrant prion disease causing mutations, and that's... The, uh, the direction that, of course, we leaned in. So here's one very simple way of visualising what's actually going on with all of these variants. Uh, in this plot, what we're doing on the x-axis is we're plotting the frequency of all of the reported prion disease mutations in our cases. So this is in our 10,500 PRNP sequenced individuals. And on the y-axis, we have the frequency of those same variants, but this time in exac, again, in an unascertained population that gives us some idea about the frequency of this, uh, this, uh, this variant within the general population. And these variants now fall into three broad clusters. So we have on the x-axis here, a whole set of variants where they're basically not seen in the general population as a whole at, at, at all. 
but they are seen in our cases. And all of those, as it turns out, are variants where we already knew, um, we already had some striking evidence that these, these were highly penetrant uh, disease-causing mutations. Sadly, this includes Sonia's variant, D178N, where we, uh, we again, it's observed at a, in nearly over 200 cases of prion disease, but there's not a single carrier in the exact cohort um, for that particular variant. So here, the comparison between our cases and our controls reinforces what we already suspected, which is that all of these variants actually confer 100% or close to 100% penetrance of prion disease. On the y-axis, we have a very different set of variants, um, and there's a little bit of wiggle room down the bottom here, but for these variants up here, we can be quite confident that, in fact, these variants confer little, little or no risk of prion disease. They are basically, uh, there's no difference in frequency between cases and controls. So that uh, as far as we can tell, there's absolutely no overrepresentation of them in cases. And it's almost certainly the case that for all of these variants here, these were simply incidental benign variants that happened to have been observed in a person who had sporadic prion disease. Therefore, they ended up in the database. And in fact, for many of these variants, there's, there's question marks that have already been raised in the literature about whether or not they were, they were actually pathogenic. So that, that fits with that. But we're left then with three really intriguing variants that sit in the middle here. And these are, these are variants where we, uh, they are clearly too common in cases to be consistent with a fully benign variants, but they're also too common in controls to be consistent with, um, uh, to be con consistent with a com completely benign variation. Sorry, to be com consistent with fully penetrant variation. So we can say with great confidence, actually, that all three of these variants do actually contribute to prion disease risk, but they're incompletely penetrant. And for the first time, we can actually put numbers on that. So we can say, for this variant sitting up here, there's less than one in a thousand lifetime risk of contracting prion disease if you're a carrier. For this variant down here, the, the, pr the probability of actually contracting a disease given that you're a carrier is closer to 10%. So we actually have now numbers, and this has never been possible before, for certainly for prion disease and for many other diseases as well, we actually have numbers that can be returned in a genetic counselling setting about the probability of actually contracting a disease given that you carry one of these variants. Um, and that is something, of course, that, uh, that is extremely important to many families affected by these, di by these diseases. So this, uh, this paper's been published. Um, all of the code that we use to calculate those penetrance estimates is, is freely available. Um, if any of you have large case series that you're interested in comparing against the exact data set, um, uh, all of that code is, uh, can be downloaded and used as well. And it's, it's worth noting that this has already proved valuable in a clinical setting. Um, so at the time that that paper was published, uh, we, it was accompanied actually by a, a news and views piece by Robert Green, Matt Lebo, and, and Sheila Sooty. Uh, in that piece, Robert Green, who was a clinician, clinical geneticist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, described a patient that he had been treating at the time that these uh, results were first made available to him. She carried the E196A mutation, which turns out to be one of those mutations right up in the top left-hand corner there. We're extremely confident that it actually has no association whatsoever with disease. This patient had, had lost her mother, um, and she, she was also a carrier of the variant. She wanted to know if she was also at risk. We know, we know for this variant, it's clearly from, the, from, from our evidence, there's no evidence of pathogenicity. There's no evidence in the literature for Mendelian segregation, no family history in other patients that have been reported with that particular variant, and the frequency is no higher in cases than controls. So on the strength of that evidence, Robert was able to go back to that patient and say that you are probably at no greater risk of prion disease than the general population. So this is, uh, this is work, I think, statistical work that, that is already having an immediate clinical impact. <coughs> Now, one of the sad things, of course, about the results of this analysis was that Sonia's variant does fall into that, that uh, category of variants down on the very bottom there, where we're pretty confident that uh, they are associated with almost complete penetrance of that particular disease. But there was one ray of good news that emerged from the exact sequencing data, and that is that, uh, that there was at least some genetic evidence supportive of a particular therapeutic strategy that Eric and Sonia and, and many others have been interested in pursuing for a number of years. Um, that is inactivation of the prion protein. So we actually found within the exact individual, so, so we know that there are a range of truncating mutations that can be found within the PRNP disease gene. Um, down towards the C-terminal end of PRNP, there are a set of truncating mutations that are associated with, with, uh, with disease. And these all turn out to be actually gain of function. Despite the fact that they're protein truncating, they actually result in a gain of function of, the, of that truncated protein. Those actually cause disease. In XAC, we were able to find three other loss of function mutations. These were nonsense and frame shift mutations that were found earlier in the protein. All of these we were able to validate. Um, in in, an, in a, two of these cases, we were able to, able to actually get cells from that individual and, and show that the variant was actually present. And as far as we can tell, all of these should result in complete loss of function of the PRNP gene. Um, all three of these individuals are not only healthy, they're neuro neurotypical as far as we can tell, and all of them have survived into their 60s or 70s. So that what this tells us is at least for heterozygous loss of function of the PRNP gene, it is actually possible to lose one copy of PRNP and still survive into, early adult, in, into relatively late adulthood without severe phenotypic consequences. 
So that's very useful, of course, for anyone who's interested in developing inhibitor molecules that knock down the levels or the function of PRNP and where it's, it's excellent to be able to actually have a human genetic validation data that tells us that that's likely to be a safe strategy. We don't necessarily know that it's, it's going to be effective, but at least it's unlikely to cause very severe disease. And on, on the strength of that and, and other findings, um, Eric and Sonia have actually now uh, started their PhDs at Harvard Medical School. They've been working in Stuart Schreiber's lab now for about a year, um, and uh, they now actually have their own prion disease lab at the Broad Institute that they're using to pursue a number of potential therapeutic options for, uh, for treating this, this horrific disease. So I think uh, what I, the point I wanted to get across here is that there's uh, exac is a starting point. It's one place that we can start to collect information that we can use to learn about the probability that someone will actually suffer from a disease given that they carry a particular variant. There's lots more work that we need to do both in exac and elsewhere to, to get to the point uh, that we need to be in, in the clinical genetic space. And I think ideally you can imagine a world where a patient uh, reports to a, to a doctor's office with, with sequence data, there is a variant that's present in that person's genome, and it becomes possible extremely rapidly to look up three different types of information about that variant. Firstly, has it ever been seen before in patients? If so, what are the phenotypes of those particular patients, and are they consistent with the patient, with the patient in front of us? So how confident we are, are we that, that's actually, that that particular variant has been seen in those patients with that disease before? Has it been seen in reference databases? And in, in four or five years' time, we can anticipate these spanning millions of individuals. Um, so we can then look up that, that variant and see how common is it, how common is it in different populations, how common is it in populations that are ancestry matched to my patient. And then finally, what effect does that variant have in high throughput assays of gene function? And those three pieces of information together, I think, will provide us with a rigorous quantitative framework that allows us to assess the pathogenicity of variants and really replace what is currently a bit of a dark art of pathogenicity interpretation, where many of us have to interpret variants because they have to be done in a clinical setting, where there's often not rigorous quantitative frameworks for actually getting that done. So I think over the course of the next four to five years, there's a clear pathway towards getting to the point of actually having those statistical frameworks in place. So EXAC, we hope, will, will perform at least some role within that, uh, within that ecosystem. There's a lot that we need to do, though, of course. One, one thing we need to do is make, make sure that EXAC gets much bigger. There's a lot we can do with more samples than, than 60,000. And so later this year, we'll be releasing, I hope, assuming calling goes well over the next few months, uh, a, a, a new EXAC data set, EXAC v2, which will span just over 120,000 exomes. We'll also be moving to genomes this year. So we've, we've uh, completed a pilot data set of 5,500 whole genomes with joint calling. We're hoping to be able to release another data set this year of just over 20,000 whole genomes. And again, that will be freely available in exactly the same way as EXAC. Um, I talked a little bit about regional constraint, but I think there's a lot of work that we could do to actually find, to be able to enable people to zoom in on particular regions of genes that contain the variants that are most likely to cause disease. And there's a, I don't think particularly as EXAC gets larger, our resolution to zoom in on particular windows of genes that are missense constrained will become finer and finer. And so doubling our sample size will really help there. And then finally, we're also conducting a, a series of pilot experiments within EXAC of genotype-based recall. Now, EXAC is opportunistically collected for most of the individuals within the data set, we actually don't have the ability to go back and get more phenotype data for those samples. But for about a quarter to a third of the samples, we can. And so over the next year, we'll be performing a series of studies where we identify genotypically extreme individuals and actually go back and get cells and phenotype data from those individuals to learn more about uh, the, the impact of those variants on particular genes. And, and also, of course, why particular individuals do not have severe diseases despite the fact that they carry allegedly dominant uh, disease variants. So the key points here are firstly, uh, unified databases of genetic variation like EXAC, and we'll see many more uh, such databases, I hope, over the next couple of years, are really useful. And there's a big benefit for the community as a whole to actually sharing our data. EXAC relied entirely on the willingness of investigators like Pam and others to, to allow their data to be used in, in this way. Uh, data that was originally designed to be used in a specific format to be shared with the rest of the community. And that's, that's really enabled a lot of analyses that would otherwise be impossible. The second lesson uh, that I think everyone is starting to get the message about now is that there's enough of us who are, who are pushing this forward, is that variant interpretation is really hard and we need to be extremely careful about how we do that and also take advantage of the publicly available data sets that exist out there. Uh, they're growing and they're getting better and better and I think it's, uh, it's increasingly important that we use those. Re gene and region constraint will be extremely useful and we'll also, as these data sets grow, we'll get more and more insight into the penetrance of individual variants. And the critical next step in human genetics, as everyone here is, of course, increasingly well aware, is that we need to be able to link these genetic data with human phenotypes. And that's where biobanks, uh, biobanks and the ability to do genotype-based recall will be absolutely essential for the next phase of human genetics. And of course, we're very excited about um, opportunities, many projects that are, that are emerging in this space over the, over the next couple of years. So with that, I'll finish by thanking everyone who's been involved in uh, putting these, uh, this data set together. 
Uh, the analysts in my lab, Monkel, as I mentioned, led a lot of the exact work. Uh, Eric, Conrad, and Anne were involved in many different analyses within the exact data set, and Eric, of course, led all the PRNP work. And Caitlin Samoka was the uh, the lead on the um, uh, all of the constraint work that I that I showed earlier. And thank you very much to all of you for listening. Thank you so much for a, just an extraordinarily wonderful talk. Um, usually, we have lots of active questions here, and so. Um, I'm hoping that you're more than willing to take of some of those. Um, and let's see if I can see them. I guess let's start with Andrew. Yeah, so uh, very exciting and very interesting. Um, I was wondering if you just expound a little bit on the degree to which people are taking the systematic mutational information you've produced and correlating that with um, the systematic structural biology and crystal structure analyses that are out there, because that's the kind of stuff that used to be done very laboriously 25 years ago for a PhD thesis per protein, and I'm sure you could do it much better now. So uh, what's, the, what's the status of that these days? Uh, so I, ha I haven't attempted that myself. Um, I think it's an extremely exciting area of research, and there's, there's um, two things have really changed, obviously, over that period of time. One is the, the sheer growth in the number of variants that are now available, the density of that variation, but also the, the amazing amount of structural information that's now available either through direct measurement or through homology modeling is out there as well. I certainly know of, there's uh, James Zhao, who's a postdoc that spent some time in my lab, has been working on domain-based constraint measurements and then correlating those with some features of information that's been extracted from structural databases. I don't actually know of anyone who's really doing a really systematic analysis of the properties of uh, variation within those correlated with you know, very fine-grained analysis of particular structural domains. I suspect that would be extremely powerful in cases where you had a whole series of proteins with very similar domain structure where you could actually pile up variation across that domain structure, across many different examples of that particular that particular protein domain. Correct. I, just, I haven't actually seen that done. I think it would be extremely cool to see it, though. I think it would actually might be much more effective than anything else you could do in structural biology right now, uh, because that's good. you don't have, I mean, that's always the problem. It takes a long time to crystallize something. So right. in terms of actually bringing new data to bear on the question of what might actually work and yeah. what might actually be disruptive or not, it's a lot faster than you know automated crystallization or anything like that. So, so I've, I've, I've had this, this picture in my head of, of, of a three-dimensional structural protein where you actually have things colored by the, the density of variation within particular uh, pictures for physical chemical properties or for conservation, but having that actually for human variation would be, would be remarkable. And that sure. actually tells you about function in a way nothing yeah. else does. So that's for quite sure. exciting. Yeah. And so as was the rest of the talk, just was an idea. So. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so when you look more broadly at, at um, more reportedly pathogenic mutations, how frequently do you see the, the same phenomenon and mis misreporting? It's difficult to put a number on it. And one of the challenges is, of course, that um, we looked at the most obvious cases. So a 1% cutoff, basically almost nothing above that 1% cutoff can actually be pathogenic or at least fully penetrant pathogenic. There's a handful of things that are actually, that, are, that have you know, some slightly increased effect or affect mild conditions, but pretty much anything above 1% is, is not going to cause disease. As you go lower and lower down the frequency spectrum, the picture becomes more ambiguous. It's much harder for us to say with any certainty that a variant with, with 1 in 1,000 frequency is definitely definitively not pathogenic just because it's present at that frequency within XAC. Our, our best estimates are that a, a shockingly large proportion of the variants that are in pathogenic variant databases at the moment are wrong. M my best guess is that somewhere around a quarter, possibly, possibly slightly more, are either wrong or have, uh, have been assigned as being fully penetrant or assumed to be fully penetrant when in fact they're not. Um, it could actually be substantially higher than that. That's not to say that everything is wrong, it's just that there has been, there has been a lot of work done by many investigators um, over a long period of time, including times when there just was no reference data set available. And, and in that space, I think the, as a result, these databases have just accumulated stuff without a clear mechanism for actually clearing that out. What we will see over the next couple of years is an increasing focus within the ClinGen project and in the ClinVar database in particular, of re-annotating and actually cleaning up those, those annotations. And I think ClinVar is actually the mutation database that many of us have been waiting for for a long time, and, and actually properly annotated database where there is a central place where this information gets stored, where there is a group who is actually dedicated to helping to clean up that database, and where we can actually eventually, not yet, but eventually we can go and say, here is a ClinVar database, here is a ClinVar variant with four stars, I'm pretty confident this is actually pathogenic and just trust that that's actually true. So we, we're, we're taking baby steps towards that, but it's going to take a while to get there. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, I'm always very interested in these examples of uh, reduced penetrance. And I was actually, um, last week we had a, a talk by Professor Katsanis, mm -hmm. and he showed that you can have compensating mutations within um, 
basically the same protein that actually mm -hmm. neutralized the effect of a mm -hmm. mutation. And when I was uh, seeing th that example in Prion, you know, with the 10 percent, um, you know, reduced penetrance, is there any evidence that there will be compensating mutation in the same protein that can be explaining this uh, reduced penetrance of that variant, and can you actually use the exec uh, browser to find these mutations? So we're still digging, and I think it's a, it's a fascinating question about exactly exactly how these systems are acting. There, there is a known, relatively common missense mutation within PRNP that is known to have some impact as to whether, um, whether another missense mutation within the same gene will actually be pathogenic. So that was incorporated into analysis in, in various ways. So it's known that there are some local effects within PRNP. But for the vast majority of variants that we found here, that doesn't explain the variation that we see here. And in fact, there's no other missense mutation within most of those individuals that could explain it. So it's not a simple compensating mutation. I think in some cases you can imagine, we actually don't know this, you can imagine that there's an EQTL that happens to be present on the same haplotype that results in a downregulation of that particular missense variation. And Tuli Lapalainen, who's at the New York Genome Center here, I know is, is actively exploring that concept across a, a whole range of different genes. So there's an interaction then between regulatory variation and, and, and coding pathogenic variation that results in a dominant missense mutation not being highly expressed and therefore not, not contributing to disease. That's one mechanism. There are others that I, that I think, I think in many cases it's, it's actually very simple. The missense mutation actually does just increase the probability of misfolding of that protein. And over the course of a person's lifetime, given how many folding events actually occur, there just is a, a possibility of aggregation that accumulates over time. And that's, that's, it's a stochastic process. And maybe if, there were, maybe if those individuals lived to be 150, they would all have prion disease. But in the course of a normal human lifespan, that just doesn't happen. So that's another possibility. I actually don't think we know. I don't think we have enough information yet to really distinguish between those possibilities. So I didn't hear you say big data, but I did see it on your slides. <laughs> Uh, so my question is about the, the uh, really nice work, so great talk, and it, uh, the question is about the really nice work with the very extensive number of cases for prion disease. Uh, so can this, uh, what is the actual aggregate frequency adjusted now for things that you think are fully penetrant? How does that jive with what we know or what we think we know about the genetic incidence of the of disease? Yeah, so it actually fits pretty nicely. So the if you go back to the... Um, yeah, here we are. So basically, of the variants that we can confidently sign as being fully pathogenic, they turn out to be present zero times within EXAC. So, th so that is within the range of confidence intervals of what we would expect to see f within, that, that, within this particular sample set. And I believe, er I know Eric has done this calculation, I haven't actually seen the data myself. If you multiply up the carriers of these variants here, again, that, that, that would contribute to some very small increase in the risk of prion disease in the population as a whole, mm -hmm. that I think falls within the range of what we would expect to see. So, so these variants probably explain the vast majority of prion disease uh, variation within the general population. So for this particular disease, I think we're converging on having almost a complete understanding of the genetic architecture of the disease, which is cool. The challenge, of course, is then how we, ex how we extrapolate that model to any other disease. And we're, we're trying it now with a group in the UK on cardiomyopathy, which is much, much more complicated. And there I think we can make some headway but not get to the point of, of really fully understanding the, the, the causes there. For many of these other diseases, either because we just can't get enough cases or because there's so much locus heterogeneity, that's going to be much, much harder. So um, have you thought about, sorry, can I ask a follow-up? So have you thought about uh, reaching out to some of these federated patient networks and actually engaging, you know, patient participants in some of these efforts? Yeah, we've definitely thought about it. We haven't made much progress in that. And I think it will, there will be some diseases where this works really well because of the properties of those diseases. And we should think carefully, I guess, about which, which ones mm -hmm. to go after. But yeah, we, ha we haven't actually, actually done that much work in that yet, for sure. Hello. Um, I apologize if you mentioned this in your talk and I missed it, but uh, have you given any thought to providing haplotype information with mm -hmm. the exact variants? And when do you think they will be available, if so? Yeah, so uh, yes, definitely. In fact, we've, we've actually got now a matrix generated with a lot of computation that actually says for, for any pair of variants found within a particular gene, it gives you the co-occurrence of those, those pairs, that pair of variants. So basically how many individuals the, that pair of variants was actually seen together in, which turns out to give you it's not a perfect phasing by any means, but it actually gives you a pretty good idea about whether or not they're likely to be in cis or in trans, particularly for doubletons or higher. So that information's present. The one thing we're just basically, before we release that, there's two things we have to f sort out. One is how we release the data. It's, it's an, just absolutely enormous data set. It has billions of rows of data that we're gonna need to probably put into some s sort of relatively efficient database in order for anyone to be able to actually use it. 
The second piece is we just want to make 100% sure that we're not accidentally releasing de-identifying information, and then that has to be discussed with the consortium. Um, but I think we're definitely interested in being able to release that so that you can imagine being able to do things like, say, how, how likely is it that we find two rare missense variants in trans in a particular individual within XAC? Um, if you then find that same combination in a patient and you know it's extremely rare in XAC, then that gives you much more confidence that it's actually a you know, recessive disease-causing combination. So having that type of information for every gene would, be, would definitely be very cool. Great. I have a, I have a question. Sarah. Um, in the right slide is up here. So how dependent is this data on the fact that you have complete ascertainment for the disease phenotype? Mm -hmm. you know, so, so you know your ability to estimate risk for the people in purple it mm -hmm. is sort of based on that. I can't imagine that there are going to be many or any other diseases where that's the case. And yeah. so the vision, which everyone wants is the ability to go and roll out and be able to say exact, you know, give people exact measures of risk is going to be tough. Ex even extremely if, hard. Even That's if right. You have all the data, For sure. Even if you have the, the biological assays. And if it is, your is thoughts on that? I, I think it's, it's even is slightly. It, is it a modelable question? Is, are there yeah, I think, approaches I, I, I think so. And again, I'm not, I mean, I, I mean, you may, you may actually disagree and you, you probably actually be right if you, if you did, but I, I think, it, I think it's pretty likely that there are ways at least for some diseases, of actually getting a sense of what that ascertainment bias is and knowing, knowing what fraction of the total cases we actually have. Then those may be more or less fuzzy, but they'll at least give us some probabilistic estimate that we can shove into our equations to, to come up with some, some estimate of, of how things work. I, I, I do agree with you. I think um, the PRNP example turned out to be a really good example for a whole bunch of different reasons. It just worked. It was a single locus. It's very simple. It's dominant. And we had complete, wanted, yeah. complete ascertainment. And I had someone who knew literally everything about prion disease who was just working on that. So that, that helped a lot. I think we can make progress. There are definitely some areas we can make progress. And I think cardiomyopathy is one that I'm very enthusiastic about. That is, that is a situation where we have now nearly 10,000 people worldwide have, have had, with cardiomyopathy, have had exome sequenced. It's actually possible then to do some of these analyses between those 10,000 and exact scale analyses. So for, for that type of disease, I think there's a, there's a real, there's a way to actually drill down on individual variants and demonstrate they're not actually causal. For many other diseases, I think, um, not only do we not have complete ascertainment, in many cases we actually have no idea what the ascertainment is, and those are going to be incredibly difficult, and I, I don't necessarily have a good answer for those. What other diseases, just out of curiosity, what other, other diseases like cardiomyopathy do you think are going to be good examples? So, so I, don't, I don't know if this is going to end up working out well, but I think one, one disease we're quite interested in pursuing is retinal degeneration diseases. These are genetically extremely heterogeneous, um, but there are large cohorts out there that could actually be studied, and the genetic architecture of them is, is relatively relatively well understood. Another disease that we're now going after in a, in a big way is limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which is a, one of the more common adult onset forms of muscular dystrophy. So for that, we now have 1,500 cases with exome sequencing data ascertained somewhat uniformly, um, but still representing, a, you know, still a, a tiny fraction of the global cases of this disease. So again, in that case, I think we'll also be able to make some estimates about penetrance for the dominant causes. Um, but all of those will fall well short of the, the types of numbers and the simplicity of the analysis in, in prion disease. So I think it's going to be hard to, to meet that. Are there other questions? If not, let's thank Daniel. Thanks, guys.